Testing. Oh, now it's one bar. <laughs> okay. Let me plug this in. I'm going to make sure. I don't want to talk for 10 minutes and then think, oh, crap. It's turned off. When did it stop? That happens all the friggin' time. I get to record something? That gets my goat. Holy crap. Super, super What did tangled. you do? Tie this in a knot before we came? See, I don't know how these things happen, because no, I didn't do anything except for just leave it in there, and somehow it ties itself into a knot. It's amazing how good of the knot the knot gets with cords, too. It's Gremlins, I guess. Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise crazy. Just be glad it's him, not you. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio no. Fiction magazines that gets my goat <laughs> sorry i was just starting out like a normal show and i realized that's not right well i didn't realize that you realized that but you didn't realize that either you just thought i was being annoying huh oh i, I did yeah cause yeah that was an actual legitimate mistake unlike normal when i'm I am just being annoying we hardly ever do dune steves anymore this yeah it won't be long now before that gets my goat passes Dune Steve. That's true. We're in the one forties now on That Gets My Goat. That's true. It's going to happen soon. We do one every week or so with that, but the regular story episodes. They're supposed to be at least two a month. But we've fallen behind again, which is sad. Through the Den of Silence is done, so Yep, I'm, I'm gonna get for it. You. I'm gonna get it out there. Oh, really? You you're finished your half too? No, but I'm gonna get it out there oh, soon. Okay. Well, but it may be a lot of work for you too once you level it and go. Oh my gosh! I did the sound level is it. absolutely shite. And um, I tried to listen and I could not hear Renee. So we may have to do something about that. Sorry, that this is all outtakes. Ah, uh, hi. This is Big Anklevich. and this is Rich Outfield, and. What are we talking about today? Do you want to talk about Tom Cruise being Tom Cruise crazy? Well, I think it's kind of part of the conversation. Today, instead of working on the regular show, Rish and I went to watch a movie. And all the movies that we were really interested in have kind of come and gone. And so this time, we went to a movie that just kind of appealed to us. It's, it's weird. I feel like kind of a hypocrite. And I mentioned this to you earlier when we were talking about going to see this movie. We talk a lot, especially on this show, That Gets My Goat, about how screwed up Hollywood is. And how Hollywood only makes sequels. Remakes. They only make remakes. They only make franchise films. If you don't already know the name of the movie, then they're not interested in doing it. If a movie isn't something you, oh, Scooby-Doo, there's an, oh, I'm going to see that. But if it's just a movie about a kid who has a dog and it's called, I don't know what. Ruffy, okay, then you won't go see it. Or in general, that seems to I don't know. Does that count? Is that is that a true statement, or is it just that's what Hollywood thinks? In this economy, that seems to be what Hollywood is solely interested in: franchise films. Now, if they can put out something that's the start of a franchise, yay! But they'd much rather put out the part three of something. Right. When they guarantee that they're going to make their money back in that. And, and yeah, we complain about budgets too, that they will make, you know, one $250 million movie instead of six or seven $30 million movies. Right. Which to me makes no sense, but that's just the way that they have done it. I, I don't know. I mean, it, the 80s were long enough ago that the, the execs today have never known a time that wasn't the blockbuster mentality. Right. So we complain about that a lot on the show, about how sad it is that you can't get just a normal movie anymore. It's a franchise, and, you know, the start of a franchise, like you're saying, even a Divergent or whatever, that's a franchise. They already know it's a series, and they expect to make many more afterwards. And sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes it's just the golden compass, and that's all you get. But other times, they're just like, all right, we got a franchise. Yeah, it's going to be four movies, even though there was only three books. I don't care. And we bemoan that fact a lot on this show. And yet, when I saw the trailer for this film, I thought, you know, that looks like a good movie. Maybe I'll see it in the Dollar Theater. Maybe I'll probably just see it on video. Or, uh, no, when it comes down to it, I probably won't see it at all. <laughs> 
And that's what what would have happened had you not dragged me to it, really. If, if you hadn't said, let's go see that tonight, I want to see it, I would have never seen it. I probably would never, ever have seen it. And that makes me, I guess, a really big hypocrite. I am willing to go out and see the films that, you know, I, I know are going to be hits for me, you know, not misses when, I, when I'm talking about hits like that. You know, I'll go with you to see the X-Men film. I'll go with you even to see Amazing Spider-Man 2. Even though I know that's not going to be a good movie already before we go to see it. I went to see it because, hey, it's Spider-Man. But The Edge of Tomorrow comes out. The trailer looks great. And I'm just like, meh. Probably not. I'll probably never get to it, I guess. And... The last time I can think of a movie where I said, no, I'm going to see it, even though there was no franchise, there was no name that I knew, there was no backing behind it, would be Inception. Which was just, it's just one time thing. It's not going to have sequels. It's, I mean, it was a big idea film, but so was this. Big idea, big budget. And yet, for some reason, I was willing to back then for that one. This one, I was like, blah. And uh, that makes me a, a hypocrite piece of crap. Um, but you did go to it. Yeah. It's not like you put your foot down and said, what if I don't like it? Or or whatever reason it is. And you went to it and you enjoyed it. But you started out with that Jonathan Colton song. Is it Jonathan Colton? Yeah. How much of your hesitancy to see the movie was Tom Cruise's fault? <laughs> I'm sure it's some of it. It's weird because I don't dislike Tom Cruise. You know, I, I didn't get all into the Tom Cruise has gone batshit crazy now. He's jumping on Oprah's couch uh, and doing just weird crap. I didn't care. You know, I don't watch TMZ's show. I don't... Uh, I'm not interested in any of that. I don't read the Perez Hilton blog. I don't give a crap about that kind of stuff. And for the most part, I don't know unless they're really, really, really well-known exploits of crazy celebrities. I don't know about them. I mean, I do know Tom Cruise is crazy. I know that uh, Lindsay Lohan, you know, is, is gone off the rails and she's always on drugs and always in court. I know in general, but... Justin Bieber's a c These are things that, uh -huh. that everyone knows. But for the most part, I don't know what's going on with that. But yeah, I think Tom Cruise has just kind of, he's lost his luster, I guess. I don't know. I'm not sure why that is, because the movies that he's in, they're not bad. And he has a big movie like this one every year. Last year was what, Jack Reacher? Was that last year or was that the year before? That might have been the year before. He had Oblivion last year. Okay, Oblivion. Did you see that? I never saw, but... I think I remember thinking that would probably be good, too. Was it? Did you see it? It was pretty good. I mean, I had issues with it, but they had nothing to do with Tom Cruise. I thought this was a much better film, but I, I'd still recommend that you see Oblivion. I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, see, that one sounded good to me. I did go and see, and this is now several years ago, and it's funny that I ever saw this. I think this was another one where I wound up getting dragged to because I don't like Cameron Diaz either. But I wound up seeing that movie, which you know what that one's called? Like, totally... the, the, it's the one with him. Where he's the secret agent, and Cameron Diaz gets kind of sucked into his thing. It wasn't called Killers. That was the Ashton Kutcher one, right? Uh, I never saw that one, actually. Yeah. It was that night and day movie. I haven't liked a movie she was in since There's Something About Mary, which was a long time ago. Just something about her that grates on my nerves. And... Yet I enjoyed that film. Both her and Tom Cruise were not bad at all in it. Um, I had no reason to dislike it. I don't know. Cruise tends to choose big, fun movies. You know, he, he, he tends to make the same kind of movie over and over again, but they tend to be crowd pleasers, the kind of movies that I enjoy. Was Jack Reacher good? Yeah. See, that one looked good, and I f discovered that that was from a book. A book, I, yeah, a book series. It was like book no seven idea. in the series. Oh, it was, was the first one they decided to make. That's weird. I don't understand why. Just the general public opinion. It's like, you know, the the Jehovah's Witnesses are knocking at your door, and you're like, I'm not opening that door. But 
for all you know, you'd love being a Jehovah's Witness if you just gave it a chance. I don't know, you know what I mean? It's just the public opinion is don't open that door. More appropriately, the Scientologists are knocking on your door to convert you to Scientology. Okay, and the, you're like, I'm not opening that door. The zombies are trying to get into your house. And if you just let them in, you'd become a zombie too. And maybe you'd love Yeah, you'd being probably a enjoy being a zombie and getting to eat brains and all that stuff. It, brains are tasty from what I've heard and saw on Temple of Doom. But yeah, I wonder if that's got something to do with it. It's just Tom Cruise has become synonymous with being a weirdo he does uh tend to make really similar movies and his characters tend to be really similar now tom cruise has won he won an oscar right for acting at one point or was it just a golden globe he may have gotten a golden globe for jerry Maguire. I, I, he's never gotten an oscar he won a big award for a movie uh where he played like a salesman type guy. It was an independent movie. I don't remember what it was. Was it Magnolia? Yeah, that, I think that was it. Magnolia. Um, and it was kind of around the time we're like, hey, it's Tom Cruise's resurgence. That was probably close to the time that Jerry Maguire came out too, wasn't it? It was a few years after. Yeah. Tom Cruise was having a kind of a big resurgence and then he went off the rails and the resurgence kind of went away. But... Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's won awards for acting. He's, I don't know if anybody would consider him a great actor or a really good actor. I don't think he's down on the level of like The Rock or <laughs> someone like that where he's like, oh, come on, The Rock. <laughs> you made Hercules played by The Rock. That's funny because there was a trailer for that and you said, was that The Rock? Kind of like, what are you guys trying to pull on me? Hey, yeah, they put hair on the rock so you didn't look like the rock just so that they would fool you into going to see Hercules because you wouldn't realize, oh, wait, the rock is Hercules? Oh, crap. <laughs> I had high hopes for this. Oh, man. You know, he, he's not down at that level where you know he's just a, just a Sylvester Stallone slash Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of action hero that can't do anything be themselves but he does have a certain character that he plays you were saying that he always is a a kind of a smarmy douchebag kind of overly self-confident kind of a guy his characters are and he even started out this film as exactly that well i think this film somebody must have seen that said what are negative things do people say about tom cruise and let's have him be that in this just to sort of undercut all the criticism for right up the beginning, then give him, you know, room to grow. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought it was brave of Cruz to play this character because he is kind of a prick at the beginning and he can't fight. And, he, you know, he, so I liked him from the very beginning because he was playing this character who's, you know, he was going to do anything he could to get out of fighting. I, I, when you and I did uh, Last Contact and we talked about we had that conversation where... For Hughes to truly have an arc, a character arc, then he had to start in a place where he was either prejudiced or kind of an a-hole or at least unlikable and then learn something through the course of the story. And I'm, I'm hoping that this episode has aired after <laughs> The Last Contact, but once a couple years had passed and I could look at the story with perspective i felt like oh shoot maybe hughes should have been more of an a-hole more of a jerk so that he would have more room to cover by the, the end of the story when he says look at us we're the ugly ones anyhow that's how i felt with edge of, of tomorrow yeah they gave they, they made him a coward they made him kind of a prissy slimy politician type guy and he had to earn all of his muscles and his skills and all that stuff yeah, that was very cool. It was it was a worthwhile character arc to go through. And sometimes, especially with these kind of movies we've been talking about, where it's the franchise film, you know, there's only so much you can do with the franchise. You can't have your characters change all that much uh, again and again and again. You know what I mean? They start out the first movie as an a-hole and then learn to be a good person. But then when they do the second movie, what do they do? Somebody else, maybe it has to be like Monsters Incorporated, where, okay, now Mike is the main character. Sully had his 
arc in the last one. Now this time Mike's going to have his arc and uh, you know maybe that's the way you can do it but in, in well, the did, movie did like this they didn't Skyfall? have to. I haven't seen Skyfall, no. Well, the the funny th- trick that they pull to make you care in that movie is instead of just saying, you know, oh, these guys are all going to kill James Bond, who you know is never going to die, they say these bad guys are going to kill the people that are close to James Bond. And you know all of them are expendable. And suddenly it's like, oh, you know, any of those guys can be killed and you start to be afraid again, which I thought was very, very clever with Skyfall. You know, I don't. I don't know. When it's a long series of movies, we expect characters to act a certain way. We feel like we know those characters, and we don't want them to act outside that box. And you can see a movie like X Men: Days of Future Past. Wolverine is the exact same character that he was in the two thousand right. X Men. But there's that scene where he tells Xavier that when I first met you, you know, I was worse than anything you know that you've ever had to deal with. And it was just like. But you're still that same character. You're the same guy. There's been no character growth at all. It, Wolverine was always the coolest guy in the room, and he still is. But he went back in time to before he learned that stuff. Maybe that was it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, we had kind of three subjects when we were starting this out. We got Tom Cruise being Tom Cruise crazy. We got... Box office returns for Tom? Is that a separate subject? Were that one of the three? I can't remember. I know one of them was the movie itself. One of them is Tom Cruise, and I think one of them is... I wanted to talk about the time loop stories. Oh, right, time loop um, stories. We don't okay. have time to talk about box office returns in this thing. Cause well, we'll talk about it super fast. two minutes before the recording is done. And <laughs> so I think we probably should finish Tom Cruise crazy for now. Well, that's part of it, I think, the box office okay. returns, because... This movie came out the same week as The Fault in Our Stars, which is a romantic comedy slash tragic (laughs) death of a cancer patient movie. Right. Is it a comedy? (laughs) Uh, Well, I don't... Can you just say romance? Is that allowed to be said anymore? I hope so. Is that a real genre? Well, you can say drama if you want. Okay. It's a drama, a teenage drama about a dying cancer patient and her love that she meets in her cancer support group. Right. Which sounds like a damn downer of a movie. It sounds really depressing. Sounds like it's probably a difficult film. And yet that movie made $48 million its yes. opening weekend. And this movie made 24 Okay. Does that sound right to you? I, I don't know. I didn't I don't, know. I didn't read today. I looked to see because I was kind of interested. And it basically made twice as much... As the big sci-fi epic film that came out in the same week, which is weird, because that is exactly the opposite of the way it should be. Now, in these films, you had Tom Cruise, who is crazy, and people are averse to going to see Tom Cruise films, it seems. Seems like each time his movie makes less money and less money and less money, despite the fact they still cost the same. (laughs) They're making less and less and less. And you were saying the last time he made a movie that made over $200 million was War of the Worlds. Which was 2005, yeah. Which was a long time ago. And in the other movie was Shailene Woodley, uh-huh. who is the chick that was in Divergent. So maybe all the Divergent fans went to see this because now they're a fan of Shailene Woodley. But I don't think so. Maybe that's the case, but I don't think Jennifer Lawrence movies have been getting all business just because fans of Hunger Games started, oh, we're going to go see whatever else she makes, like The Hustle, you know, we're going to go, or American Hustle, Mm -hmm. we're going to go and see American Hustle (laughs) because Jennifer Lawrence is in it. If you go see American Hustle, sir, it's because Jennifer Lawrence is in it. Okay. (laughs) I'm just saying, she was so good in that movie, where it's just like, dang, man, I didn't like this movie, but every time she was on screen, I was happy. But I really doubt the Hunger Game fans are going to see that. I wouldn't think so, no. But I, Because of her. And they're not going to see X-Men Days of Future Past because of her. You know, they're not going to see... What's the one with the freaking where he's the Eagles, crazy Eagles fan? That had Jennifer Lawrence and Bradley Cooper in it? Oh, it's Silver Zero. Linings Playbook. Silver Linings Playbook. There you go. They're not going to see that one. Yeah, I thought you meant the real Eagles. The oh. band. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I think that it's really unlikely that Shailene Woodley is behind the fact that it trounced it. I think it's much more just that Tom Cruise was in it. 
I don't know how many people are just like, no, I'm not going to see that. No, Tom Cruise, F that. Tom Cruise sucks. <laughs> Can't stand that guy. Well, he's almost... freaking maverick in every movie that he's been that's in. That's true. Yeah. And screw him, you know. I, I, I'm guessing that's got to be what's behind it. And I wonder sometimes if you're somebody, and I'm, I think this is a original screenplay, right? It wasn't a No, it was beforehand. based on a, a Japanese book and a manga. Oh, okay. I guess it was a, a, a Japanese comic book. So, yeah, it makes me wonder, if, if you had a property, if you wrote a book and you're like, oh, they just bought the rights to my book, I'm so set, I'm going to be J.K. Rowling now, I'm going to be Stephanie Meyer and make so much money because of these movies, and then they cast Tom Cruise as your main character, are you like, oh, crap! There goes my free freaking lunch. <laughs> I'm so screwed. Nobody's going to go see it now. But there, there's there's a flaw in your reasoning, though, because somebody has to be going to these movies or studios wouldn't keep paying $200 million for a Tom Cruise movie. And I think it's got to be the international market. Cruise is still a huge star. Would you have knowledge of the history of his box office internationally? No, but I just, I know that, like, you know... Oblivion did all right here, but it did well yeah. overseas. You know, the Mission Impossible movies do all right here, but they do insanely well overseas. Yeah, that is something that uh, we tend not to pay close attention to because... Because we're the center of the universe. We're the center of the universe, and we watch more. And also, the other thing behind that is that the international box office is a relatively new thing. Uh, they weren't making huge money off of international releases until the last 15 years or so before that it was just like yeah we made this much oh they also made like a quarter of that overseas you know but now all of a sudden that i'm i'm starting to see even things where they go straight to that international you know the the worldwide box office instead of just domestic versus international and that kind of thing I think that's how they declared Frozen as the biggest animated feature of all time, is by adding up and saying this has now made two billion worldwide, which makes it now the biggest. They're not even bothering with the the domestic box office so much anymore. So I guess that's a big deal, and maybe they just don't know as much about how crazy he is overseas, <laughs> or or what's the deal with that? You think? They didn't get to see the episode of Oprah where he got up on the couch and was jumping and saying, I love Katie Holmes. I don't know. It may not be as important to them. Because, you know, that's a big thing about America is we love our, our stars. We love our celebrities. We love our heroes. But we love to see them fall. We love to find out the dirt and find out that they're just like us. And maybe in other countries, you know, like maybe in Japan, it's still okay to hero worship somebody. I don't know. Huh. I don't know. A thing with fault in our stars, I, to me, that's remarkable. I never could have guessed that it would make that much money. But it was based on a book, and they said 10 million copies of that book were sold. But still, that's nothing. That's not... Uh, if Well, if 10 million people went to see Fault in Our Stars, it would do pretty well, wouldn't it? I guess what I was trying to say is that nobody reads. I don't... I, don't, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> but th there was a huge, like... Twitter and social media, Facebook campaign behind Fault in Our Stars, and they were going for young girls. And, you know, ever since 1997, young girls have been a driving force in, in the, at the box office. And Hollywood seems to get that. Or maybe there's like one guy in 10 that gets that. And everybody else is like, nope, teen boys, teen boys, they buy toys, teen boys, they put butts in the seat. That's what we need. See? Lots of explosions. Butts in the seat, see? See, I didn't see The Fault in Our Stars, so I don't know if it's really bad. But it, it looked it looked like it wasn't stupid. And a lot of these YA movies look like they're stupid. So I was totally fine when it uh, made money. Yeah, I bet it's got a lot more. I'm judging that. I mean, since it came from a book, that I guess that doesn't always mean something. But it generally means that you've got a more thought-out story sometimes than just a random shoot 'em up or whatever. But yeah, I don't know. I think that's it's interesting that this movie was trounced so badly by just a, a romance, a drama, a non-genre film in any way. It's not a superhero movie. It's not a, a sci-fi related film. 
Although sci-fi doesn't seem to be the money maker that it once was. It used to be sci-fi, you know, you, you put that out and you can start cashing the checks. You know, it was like Independence Day set that bar and all the movies just kept hitting. They'd jump up and hit that bar every time, although I think you're supposed to jump over the bar, but they just would hit it. They didn't jump over it. They were like the guys that are walking underneath the awning and then they have to run up and jump and hit the little uh, cross bar. That's what the sci-fi films would do. But they're, they're, they're too short now. They can't hit the bar anymore. They jump up and they miss it. They're like that friend that you had that couldn't jump. And he jumps up and he t he's the one guy of all the group that can't hit the bar. And he just kind of plays it off and goes, <laughs> and says a joke so that people don't beat him up. Well, it's there's too much. Too much competition. There's too many tentpole movies. We've talked about that. The, the studios save all of their movies for May, June, and July. And then the rest of the year, there tends to be, you know, whatever's left. And it cannibalizes, you know. It just it used to be that it was a big deal when there was a science fiction movie because they were so expensive to make. Studios could only make, you know, one every other year or whatever it was. And now you get a genre movie a week. And they're not guaranteed to be even well done. Um... It's not like they're all going to be Independence Day where you're like, yeah, I loved it. Oh, my gosh. Well, see, some people would point to Independence Day as, you know, the one that broke the mold. I don't. I think Independence Day was very well made. But, uh, you know, when a movie like Transformers comes out that is maybe not universally reviled, but certainly critically panned and in general, everybody a lot of people are just like good. Ugh. And yet every single one of those movies has made unbelievable amounts of money. Then that lowers the bar for everything. Where it's like, right. you know, quality no longer matters. What matters is the toy line or the brand or, you know, the, yeah, that's the, what it the trailer, the amount of explosions and titties or whatever that we can put in the trailer. Yeah, it seems like that's what it is. It's just the brand now. If you don't have a brand like this movie, which was a terrible brand. I mean, we were talking about it as the movie ended. It comes up and, you know, Tom Cruise, well, I said a couple of the big names, and then it's at Edge of Tomorrow. And I said to you, what do you think of that title? And you said, well, it's better than All You Need Is Kill, which apparently was the title of this, story, this movie before. They changed it to Edge of Tomorrow, but in my mind, they both suck. They're both useless. Well, Edge of Tomorrow sounds like a soap opera. Right. But... We've, we've talked a million times about whoever decides what things should be called and changing titles because they test better with their market research. And yeah, Edge of Tomorrow is vague. And like you said, it doesn't really describe the film. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the film other than the fact that Edge of Tomorrow means future, means sci-fi. That's basically all they got out of their title is, hey, everybody, look, this is a sci-fi movie. They could have come up with dozens of titles that would have fit the story better and still said sci-fi movie and probably said something more. Hey, remember that movie about the guy who keeps dying and coming back again and again? Well, we had a movie kind of like that a couple of years ago with Jake Gyllenhaal called Source Code. And that sh title is so shitty, it makes Edge of Tomorrow look like die hard <laughs> but the people that are in charge of titling things I don't know what they're thinking you know with a, with a movie like Quantum of Solace or a movie like what was the other one that came out at the same time as Source Code The Adjustment Bureau oh my goodness these are bad titles <laughs> at least Source Code sounds vaguely like it might be interesting Adjustment oh. Bureau sounds like you're going to see a movie about a dull government agency and you're going to see a lot of people standing in lines and complaining <laughs> source code at least okay it's got something about computers so it might be computery did the you see source code i saw neither of those unfortunately although they both sounded interesting if i remember right it was a while ago and yeah, just having mentioned them now i want to see them again <laughs> but that's a whole was... other episode and don't even get me started on Tangled. okay oh yeah we won't that's the new deal, though. I mean, they got Tangled, and now there's Frozen, and there's... I'm sure the next one, when they get that one set up, will be almost exactly the same, but a different 
vaguely related to the story word. We've talked Tom Cruise and his detrimental effect on this film, which is really too bad. You say this came from a manga. Yeah. Uh, which I guess means that it has a source material. Um, manga is not huge business, I should say, in the U.S. just yet. It's big business, I would say, but it's, it's still fringe. It's still kind of fringe stuff. It's uh, it's not to the level of like a, a regular comic book, a domestic comic book, I guess we could call it or whatever. But with a source. Uh, like that you can often expect more and this film i thought had a really solid premise a really interesting idea going on and i thought they did a really good job taking it where they took it they did a lot of really fun stuff you know it's one of those things that i really love seeing is just that groundhog day thing where you're reliving the same and they'll just cut they'll just straight up cut right from one try at something to the next try, you know, he'll say something and then he'll mess it up and cut. He'll be right back doing it again. Like the time he got ran over by the truck when he was <laughs> trying to escape, you know. He rolls over under the truck and then you just hear, ah! And then right back to him doing push-ups again. And he tries it again. And they didn't need to do that. There's no real purpose to it other than that it makes it fun. and made the movie more interesting as you'd see each... Each time he does something slightly different. I love that. One time when I was in college, there was some play, and it was just a class, an acting class, and somebody was doing their play. And, yeah, the, the, they just had a little bell like you would ding for service. And, like, somebody was just sitting there, and this guy walks up, and he sits down next to this girl, and he starts trying to pick up on this girl. And he's like, oh, what you reading there? And she says, the sound and the fury. And he goes, oh, Hemingway, bing. Oh, Faulkner. You know, <laughs> they would just do the, the ding, like, okay, now we're starting over kind of a thing. They would jump back with that. And there's so many different ways you could do it. Um, and, yeah, it's just, it's a cool thing. Uh, what other films are there that have done this, this same kind of an idea? I mean, we talked about Groundhog Day already, which I guess critics were complaining that this was too similar to. Well, I, I mean, I heard people complain about it. Oh, it's just like Groundhog Day. And I was like, well, yeah, 20 years ago there was a movie about a guy who relived the day. Yeah, th this has been done a bunch of times. It's a, it's an interesting sci-fi concept, and you can do it in a super serious way, and you can do it in a super funny way. You can do it in a light way, or you can have the world come to an end. At the end of each time, you have to go back and save the whole world. I love, what would you call it, the time loop storyline, that, 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 that premise yeah, one of the best episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation is is the one where they crash with another ship at the very beginning, at the teaser. And then it starts the day over again. And it ends with them blowing up the Enterprise, crashing into a ship. And they just keep reliving the day until they get it right and don't blow up the Enterprise. And it's just like such a friggin' great episode. It's called Cause and Effect. And uh, there, yeah. there was a sci-fi movie, I think, called like 21... 02 or 2201 or something like that which was right around the same time as Groundhog Day and I don't think it even got released because Groundhog Day was a hit and they're like oh <laughs> we better not release this they just put it straight to video uh, and there was that source code flick yeah it's in, you know I actually just finished reading Stephen King's 11 20 yeah 11 22 63 which is a terrible title because you can't remember it that was basically the same thing they had a rabbit hole and he would go down this rabbit hole and it would always take him to the same day in 1958 and it would start over. And the interesting thing with that was that you could go there and then come back to when you started from. And so this guy was, it was at the back end of a diner. And so this guy was, was going back to 1958 and buying meat for cheap and then <laughs> selling it in 2011 for, you know, more and, and getting really rich off of this. You know, it's an interesting con. It kept going back and getting that same meat over and over and over again. Somehow people ate this same meat. You know, it, it solved the world's food crisis, basically, because <laughs> never, they never had to kill another cow because he bought the same beef and served it again and again. It was the loaves and the fishes. It's just such an interesting uh, concept. And I actually have probably five 
stories in my head that are the same concept where somebody goes back in time and, and they keep, they have to keep redoing that kind of thing and they're able to just go back just a little bit etc i don't know I, I love the idea you know the, the people who are complaining oh it's groundhog day are, are very short-sighted because there are a billion possibilities with this one idea of what you could do with it and I was really pleased with how this movie was. It, they did a great job with this concept. But see, and this one was unique because to start the day over, all he had to do was die. So this was like, oh, shoot, I screwed up. No! And then he gets killed. Yeah. And sometimes he would be killed intentionally just to go back to be able to use what he had just learned. That, to me, was refreshing and new, and it was like, wow. And, and they don't tell us how long he'd been looping or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, they would cut to, you know, you see the same thing again. You see it once, they cut, and you see it again, and you could tell it's obviously been like 20, 30 times that he's been through this now. And I would say by the end of this movie, he'd probably lived that day at least a thousand times over. And yeah, <laughs> there were some good, some good times. Uh, and it got to the point where they would kill him every time. And then when they didn't want him to kill, he had to like really make a case. Wait, 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 no, don't kill me just yet. Um, one of the things I thought was really poignant about it too was, and it was really similar to the Groundhog Day thing, I guess, because in Groundhog Day, Bill Murray is trying to get with Andy McDowell until he knows her so well that, he, you know, he can talk about all these things that happened he's heard all her stories he knows everything about her but for her it's the first day it's always the first day and she has no depth to their relationship which and i thought that was really interesting when they did that with this film tom cruise by the end of the movie is just absolutely in love with this woman because he spent so much time with her and worked so hard with her and been through so much with her and he knows so much about her. You know, they're they're going to save the world. And she's like, yeah, it's too bad I didn't get to know you better. <laughs> you seem like a really nice guy. And it's just like, man, what? Ah, it's weird to even hear her say that. Because even us as the audience has been through more than she has with this guy. And we're just like, no. What? Oh. And that was probably, I think, one of the best parts was there's a, a part where they're trying to get to kill the, the the main bad guy and they're they keep going repeating this day over and over again and they have a part where they get to this farmhouse and it seems like to us who are watching that this must be the first time they've gotten this far we're actually seeing this for the first time because they're like sitting there and they're looking around through the farmhouse for things when if they've been there before, they just know where they are and they'll go straight to them, get the things they need and go. So it's seeming like they've never been there before. And finally, the woman realizes, oh, what is going on? And Tom Cruise has to admit that, yeah, he knows all this. So he pulls the keys to the helicopter right out of his pocket. He's got them there. He's ready to go, but he doesn't want to go because he knows that she's going to die in this moment and he can't figure out a way to get her farther and he doesn't want to lose her if he succeeds and the day doesn't repeat again then she's gone forever and he is super emotional about this and she doesn't get she's just focused on the mission and doesn't because she doesn't live this over and over again she doesn't get it even though she has had the experience before <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen for her anymore, and so she doesn't get it, and she doesn't get that emotion. It's the same thing as the other bit where she's like, yeah, he's, I don't really know you much, but you seem cool. And yet he's like, no, love of my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's funny, because, yeah, that, I, I thought that that was a really strange scene. With the tea or the coffee, yeah, and the the, the sugar, and and now when you're describing it in retrospect, I'm like, oh, that was a really nice scene. But uh, you could do so much, like you said, with this one movie. That there's this scene that is late in the movie where they like change their plan altogether and they decide to go see the general. And this is obviously like their fiftieth time trying to go see the general, and they know exactly where to stand and where to stop and where to hide and where to wait and where to turn around, and it's like a dance, a well choreographed dance. 
And I was just so enamored by that scene that I was like, this shouldn't be a movie. This should be a series. I want to see this every single week. Yeah, there's there's so many places it could have gone. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was like 25 minutes of this movie that got cut out that would be in like a director's cut or something like that where, you know, just him with his squad of reject soldiers and, you know, stuff like that. It just... Yeah, it was really interesting. I remember at the start, early on in the movie, like within the first 20 or 30 minutes, and I leaned over and talked to you and I just thought, I wonder how sick and tired the actors got of this one bit because they kept you know he leaves lives the same day over and over again and at first he's doing it the same way and so you keep seeing the same scene except for slight modifications because he's like what the heck we're doing this again uh and they must have spent probably a month i don't know <laughs> on that that one little set because that's the way they do it in movies they get the set together and then they shoot all the scenes that happen in that set and, yeah, they must have been there forever, just doing the same scene, but with little slight variations. Okay, we're going to run through this again. And how many times must they have screwed up their lines when they're like, oh, crap. Oh, that was scene 12. Sorry, we're doing scene 24 now. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, let's do this again. You know, how much trouble must that have been? Uh... I don't know. It, it was really enjoyable, though. I have to say that I was impressed by that film. I, I'm I'm glad that you dragged me out to see it. Um, and I'm glad that it was one of those types of movies uh, with that premise. It's just a premise, and we've talked about it before, just the time travel thing and reliving the same year or reliving the same day or whatever it is that you're doing over and over again. It just... It's one of those kind of things that really, really interests. Yeah, we've had two episodes of The Noon Steve where a character goes back and relives a year over and over and over again. And the two stories are so night and day dissimilar. Right. But, yeah, I'm sure you could come up with three or four other variations on that same scenario and it, they'd be just as fresh. Yeah, I think the same author could come up with three or four different variations on it and Every author out there could probably write their own version of that story, and it would just be fun. That's one of those great things. It's neat that everybody's different because there can be so many things like that. And I'm actually writing a story. I wrote the first uh, scene today. Today is my first day of the live blogging my story thing, which well, hopefully people are what, reading and are interested in. By now uh, uh, that this comes out, it's got to be done, but... Mine might not be. <laughs> but I am writing the story. It's the story of a boy whose dreams manifest in reality. And before I even started writing this story, you sent me uh, in a, a story on a website that was talking about upcoming movies, and there was a horror movie coming out called Somnia. <laughs> that's right. I think it was See, now called. that's a bad title, sir. And it's about somebody whose dreams manifest in reality. And you sent me that, and you said, oh, I don't know if I should even send you this. I probably... And I was just like, what? And I opened it up, and I started reading, and it wasn't until, like, th three-fourths of the way through the article that I finally realized why you were saying that. Because then it finally talked about that movie, and I went, oh, shoot. And it's not the first time that that's happened to me. It's not the first time where I had an idea that I thought, oh, this is a cool idea. I need to do this idea. And then a movie of that idea came out, and I thought, oh, crap, I missed my chance. But It must happen with every creative person. Because it's ha the first time it happened to me, it was like a ton of bricks falling on me. It's like, <laughs> oh, no, all this time I wasted. But it's since happened like five or six times. Right. So. And the good thing about that is I've come to realize that, so what? It's not going to be anything like my story. Or maybe it'll be somewhat similar, or who cares? My story's going to be different enough that, you know, there's no way that it can be all that similar. Yeah, there is the idea of somebody's dreams coming out in reality. And when it comes down to it, there's probably 15, 20, 30 stories like that out there right now in print and mine's going to be different than it is. 
and hopefully there's something to it that people will like and be interested in. If nothing else, hopefully the people that are already fans of the Dune Steef and fans of you and I will think, oh, I'll read a big Anklevich story about that. So I'm going to write it anyways. I don't care. It's going to be different. Just like these time travel stories. You know, you can write a hundred of them. They'll all be different because they're not written by the same guy. And they'll all be different even if they're written by the same guy because they were written at different times by the same guy. Your story that you're writing for your live blogging is a story that you already wrote and then you In lost... 2014. In, yeah, this year you wrote a really long story and then you lost it. You had it written on a notebook and you misplaced the notebook and, and you gave yourself a deadline of, okay, if I don't find this notebook by this time, I'm going to just rewrite that story. And so now here you are, you're rewriting the story. And I guarantee you, just because it was written at a different time, it's going to be very different. It's going to be similar because you're trying to write the same story, but still it's going to be very, very different because it's a different time. Well, see, I would like to meet somebody who could write the same story again <laughs> because... Yeah, the, the what interests me now, just a couple months later, is not what interested me then. Partly because I've already gone over a lot of that subject in my mind, and these are like other things that could happen with that same subject. But, boy, yeah, it would be neat if you could just write it exactly the same. Or maybe it wouldn't. Maybe that would make people less interesting than they are. Well, yeah, I think that that's just a... You know, that was one of those things I've, I've got time travel ideas in, in my mind and one of the ideas uh, involves basically jumping back in time years or whatever to a different point in your life but you bring your entire mental capacity with you so you live your life to 2014 and then now you can jump back to 2007 to a critical moment and you can land in that moment and do something different and take your life in a different direction but what would happen if you did that? Like, for example, if I jump back to oh, like... Oh, hey, almost time. About time. About time. There that you go. movie came out last year, and it we hadn't even thought of it, but it has the same premise. Not the same, but you know what I mean. Similar premise, yeah, where you could jump back. If I was to do that, for example, I still had the same job that I do now in 2005. But the equipment that we used to do that job was totally different. I haven't used that equipment in like six years, seven years. What would I do? Would I have to? I would have to go to work, and I'd be like, "Uh, how do you do this again?" <laughs> it would be like, you know, I, I like I was saying, I just read that Stephen King book, and the main character would have trouble because he jumped back to 1958, and he had a hard time keeping himself from mentioning things that weren't things until after 1958. And his love interest realizes that there's something really wrong with him because he keeps saying things that are anachronistic. And he's singing a Rolling Stones song as they're driving home that hasn't come out for another five years. You know, it'll be years before Honky Tonk Women comes out and it's way too risque for the, the point of time that he's living in. That kind of stuff... How do you deal with that? I, I, I think that's a really interesting concept uh, as far as that goes. And another thing that you could explore with time travel. Um, so, yeah, it's it's just an endless fount of ideas that I just... I, I love the idea. Someday, I hope to just publish an entire collection that's all just time travel-related stories. We both love time travel, and, yeah, it's... I pity the fool that doesn't. But, you know, there are people that are just like, yeah, because it couldn't happen. <laughs> I'd have to write all those stories, though. That's the thing about the collection. I have the ideas in my head. Hopefully I, I can turn a corner and start writing more often. I wish we wrote as much as we talk about writing. <laughs> we would be so prolific. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, and, and Have I had this conversation? Yeah, I know I have. Where Abby said that she knows she's not going to live long enough to tell all of the stories that she has in her head right now. And I was just like, whoa, that is messed up. Because you know you're going to have more ideas next year and the year after that and the year after that. Yeah. I guess you have to pick the ones that are really good when <laughs> your, your, your books are all 800 pages a piece. 
when you're writing short stories, you have a little more leeway because, you know, you can just go with the idea. Because if you write every day for a couple hours, then you'll get through a short story in uh, two or three or four days. Yeah, it, it should be much easier for me, who never has novel ideas, to just write every single one of them. But I, I don't. And I don't know what the solution is. I've lived long enough that I, I never am going to get better, am I? <laughs> Maybe. I you know, know what I mean? It's like once you hit a certain age, you're like, you know what? This is the best I'm ever going to look. <laughs> is that a Louis C.K. thing? Or he's like, I'm never going to be in better shape than I am right now. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> Well, that's true, but not necessarily. That's an, that's something... Where, where did I see that? It's some kind of one of those logic fallacies or something like that, where for some reason people believe that they're going to be as they are for the rest of their life. They're going to have the same opinions. They're going to have the same beliefs, the same mindset that they have reached now for the rest of their life. However, these same people will acknowledge that Five years ago, they believed differently about a lot of different things and had different mindsets. And they know that they've changed leading up to it. But when they get to that point, oh, now is the way I will always be. But that's not the way you're always going to be. Five years from now, you'll be totally different. You'll have a nose ring. <laughs> you'll have bleached your hair blonde. Oh, nice. You'll have got on steroids and really, really pumped up. You know, it's going to be very different. So... If you can get on steroids, you could write. Okay. I think you don't have to do one or the other even. <laughs> I think it could happen. Yeah, I've I've been kind of thinking about that. Uh, do we want to get off onto a writing tangent? No, we don't. But okay, I won't go you, on. You opened the door by saying, someday I'm going to put out a book of time travel short stories. <laughs> so it, we didn't talk about Emily Blunt at all in Edge of Tomorrow. I really like Emily Blunt, and they let her have her English accent in this. She was originally cast as Black Widow in Iron Man 2 and then had to drop out because she was had a conflict with another movie. And I always wondered what it would be like to have her as Black Widow instead of Scarlett Johansson. I, a lot of people really like Scarlett Johansson, so maybe, you know, it's all right. But. I think Scarlett Johansson does fine, but I think Emily Blunt, especially in this film, she really sells the fact that she kicks ass. <laughs> And that's what Black Widow is supposed to do. And Scarlett Johansson, it's a little more of a stretch. She's getting better at it. I think in this last Captain America movie, she sold it pretty well. She seemed like more of a badass than she ever has before. Well, I liked the scene with the chair in The Avengers. That was really cool. Yeah. I think she sells it way more as time goes by. Or maybe it's just that we've seen her at it and we don't have to be convinced or something. I don't know what it is. But Emily Blunt... You know, maybe it's just because your first introduction to her is her picture on the side of a bus, and it says... Full Metal full, Bitch. There it is. So right? I, was, I was like, cast iron, heavy metal, what is it? Yeah, the first thing is a picture of her, and it says Full Metal Bitch over the top <laughs> of it. And it's her standing there in her outfit, holding a sword over her shoulder. And so automatically, you're like, okay, this chick kicks ass. And then you meet her in the battle, and she's kicking ass. And Tom Cruise is bumbling around like an idiot because he doesn't know what he's doing. And yeah, it's it's interesting that she was really good. What other things has she been in? I don't know <laughs> actors like you do, so she may well. This may well be the first movie I've seen with her, for all I know. Really, that's interesting. She was in Adjustment Bureau, that movie I mentioned that had a bad title. That's the one with that's uh, Matthew Damon. Ma Matt Damon, yeah, and he... He doesn't go uh, by Matthew, does no, he? No, he doesn't. <laughs> I don't know why I said Matthew. <laughs> and, the, yeah, the premise of that one is he's this politician, and he's he's going on a, in a certain direction, and, and he accidentally discovers that there are forces beyond our mortal ken that are pushing him in that direction, that want him to do certain things and do not want him to do other things. And it sort of becomes... a. Uh, well, is there destiny or do I have free will? And if I have free will, can I choose to fail? Or can I, you know, can I reject my destiny or whatever? I mean, it was a heady movie and I thought it was well done, but if it was you, called The Adjustment Bureau. <laughs> if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. <laughs> is that Rush? <laughs> yes. Ugh. She was in, did you see, uh, 
the five-year engagement with her and uh, Jason Segel. Did you see that one? I did not. Oh, that seems like that would be a movie you would enjoy. Uh, your wife would fall asleep, but she would enjoy she the first would enjoy ten minutes it if of it. she made it through. Yeah, you if, should check that out on Netflix. If only. Okay, well, but Emily Blunt is tall, and she she seems to be in really good shape. I buy her as. I mean, yeah. If they said Emily Blunt is playing She Hulk, I would be like. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. I would pay my money to see Emily that. Blunt. Although I would pay money to see anyone play She Hulk. <laughs> they said Emily Blunt is Wonder Woman. I wouldn't have had a problem at all at that, Despite unless I her found being blonde. Uh, well, oh, I would hope that they'd give her dark hair. But... <laughs> yeah, but sometimes it's not easy to sell. A, a blonde person getting dark hair seems to be a harder sell than a dark-haired person going blonde. I think because of the eyebrows, although she she had dark enough eyebrows. Right? She has this really interesting bone structure and like this this pointy nose or whatever. I think her with dark hair and and a tan, you would buy her as being Mediterranean or, or you know whatever Wonder Woman is supposed to be. I just I don't want Wonder Woman to ever speak with an American accent. You know what I mean? She wears the the red, white, and blue, but she's not from here. I always want Wonder Woman to have an accent, and I. It, you know, they, they hired an Israeli actress to play her in, uh, oh, speaking of terrible titles, <laughs> in uh, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. And so it'll be interesting to see how they do Wonder Woman in that. Although, dollars to no donuts, it will not be good. <laughs> so that's a very negative attitude, but oof. Well, that's, it's nothing new. We're used to your negative attitude Wonder towards Woman's the first, Superman sequel. <laughs> Wonder Woman's first cinematic appearance was in the Lego movie. <laughs> <laughs> nice. She was good in the Lego movie, man. I was impressed. Did you see that finally? I did. It was fun. Have we... Anything left to say on this subject? Oh, or are I we just, just wandering I, far, I had far wanted afield? to talk about Emily Blunt because I like her. Mm -hmm. She's attractive, but she's not pretty. So I can buy her in a lot of other roles. I can buy her in an ass-kicking role. I can buy her as a lawyer. I can buy her as, you know, something other than just, oh, she's a model. Or, oh, she's, you know, a cheerleader or whatever. Some of these actresses, they are just, they're too round, too pretty to buy as a nuclear physicist <laughs> there's that uh, yeah I really enjoyed Edge of Tomorrow I don't think I hated the title nearly as much as you did I didn't hate the title I just found that it did nothing for the film it was a worthless title it wasn't like they took a great title like Rapunzel and changed it to Tangled but it was similar to Tangled where what does Tangled have to do with the movie nothing it has nothing to do with the movie never once does her hair even tangle Yes, hair can get tangled, but her hair does not get tangled. Not once. It has <laughs> nothing to do with the film. Just Listen like The Edge to of Tomorrow has nothing to do with this film. You got right up to the edge of tomorrow. You almost reached tomorrow. That's what they're and saying. And then he died. And, and then it started today, uh, Yeah, again. It was today again. And then they I went like all that. to the edge of tomorrow. And, oh, nope, today. Sorry. Okay, so to sum up, listen, all actors are crazy. You okay. have to be. To put yourself out there and pretend to be somebody else and to say, you know, I deserve this part over everybody else and I'm going to learn my lines and I'm going to be this person. I'm going to convince you that I'm this person and I'm going to risk everything to be in a profession where only one out of a thousand makes it and that one never gets a solitary day again in their life everywhere they go. There are going to be cameras. There's going to be people going through their garbage. They're going to be at a urinal and somebody's going to ask them for an autograph. They have to want that enough to make their whole life's work that. And so I think you need a little bit of craziness to be that. To, to, and, and enough of a drive and enough of an ego to say, yeah, there are a bunch of other beautiful women here on this audition, but I'm the most beautiful and I'm the most talented, and I'm the most worthy to be in this. So all actors are crazy, but all actors aren't Tom Cruise crazy. Well, I, Tom I, Cruise is Tom Cruise crazy. Just be glad it's him, not you. <laughs> okay, but I'm just saying we single Tom Cruise out because he has done some wacky things. And we single Tom Cruise out because of Scientology. But here, again, 
all religions are nonsense. All religions are crazy. All religions are asking you to believe in things that may seem silly or strange or illogical to somebody who's not part of the religion. Faith is that in believing something without any physical evidence, but yet saying, no, I'm going to dedicate my life to this, which you don't believe in. And that's, that's lunacy as well. Just because Scientology is new or it's science fiction bent or it's secret, we think Scientology is this terrible, awful thing. But, I mean, how is it different than the Catholic Church or than, than Kabbalah or, you know, that other one I'm not saying the name of because they'll blow me up or, you know, or, you know, being a druid or, or neo-pagan or any of that stuff. It's just en vogue to not like Scientologists. And uh -huh. Tom Cruise seems to be the poster boy for Scientology, partly because it's a Hollywood religion. Its headquarters is there right off of Sunset in Hollywood. And they, you know, they recruit and they get somebody like Tom Cruise. He literally is a poster boy for Scientology. And so, I, you know, a lot of people are really upset by that. Or it's like, oh, you know what Scientologists really believe and all that. But if you say it, you know what Jews really believe in the right tone, it does sound crazy. You, you know what Protestants really believe? If you say really like that, it's a really negative thing, too. I don't know. I just... The, the whole Scientology thing, I, I understand that it's a deal breaker for a lot of people, but, you know, why isn't everything a deal breaker? It just depends on people and what they like and what they don't like and what their tolerance level is. Some people find that to be a deal breaker. I'm not that way. I don't think Tom Cruise is a deal breaker at all. I don't know why, although, I ha like I admitted at the start, I guess the general public opinion has bled out onto me somewhat and caused me to not be interested in some Tom Cruise movies, even though I should be, like Oblivion, you were saying that I would enjoy, I never went and saw it, and I remember thinking, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, give it a chance, I, I'd like to talk to you about it. There's one other aspect of Tom Cruise's life that makes people dislike him too, but well, let's not even mention that. Ever, again, all actors are crazy, all religious people are crazy, all people are sexual beings, and whether you find dudes attractive or women attractive, you know, that's just you. Mm -hmm. All people are crazy, really, when it comes down to it. They've got their things. Everybody has their things. That's that was, right. That was one thing I saw. This, this, There's this YouTube video series that I watch fairly often. It's uh, Vsauce. And this guy just comes up and he talks about something generally scientific. And a lot, of, a lot of times it's just, what is this? And the one that I just saw recently was, what is normal? <laughs> okay. And he talked about normal. He's like, okay, let's say that you took... Uh, he's like, people aren't just one thing. So you may be normal in one way, but not in another way. And what if you took 20 general characteristics and you you know charted everybody out most likely nobody is going to be normal in all 20 of those characteristics so normal isn't normal <laughs> that's cool i'd and like you put a link to that in the show notes if you would i'd like to check to that remember out that. but uh yeah the, 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 it's an interesting thing because yeah everybody's different and everybody's got their thing rish was making fun of me today because i bought another pez dispenser did and you buy one? I'll bet you bought two or three. I did buy two, and uh, and yeah, he he, he now um, has a new thing to make fun of me about because I, I recently started doing this Pez dispenser thing. I don't know why. A year ago, I never cared about them. Didn't want one at all. I've got like fifty of them. I don't know how many I've got, but too many. Um. But you told it's yourself normal. there are certain Pez dispensers I'm never going to get. And now you've disregarded that altogether. <laughs> and you're just like, you know what? No, I want all of them except for the Hello Kitty ones. But next week I'll buy Hello Kitty. <laughs> no, I, I insisted that you stop me. Like the time that your friend said, hey, if I ever think about buying a, a filet of fish, a at, filet of fish, fish at, at sandwich at Burger King. Yeah, filet of fish sandwich at, uh, at McDonald's, then stop me. 
He says, you can hit me as hard as you want. Just don't let me ever order one again. Yeah, and that's what I want from you if I ever consider getting the Hello Kitty ones, because that means I'm gone over the rails. I did break down by Miss Piggy, which I, I'm not a fan of Miss Piggy. I think she's an annoying character. But there's only four Muppets available right now, and I thought, yeah, it won't hurt to have one that I... Not a big fan of. Um, well, yeah, everybody has their thing. Me, I like boobs. I, I know that makes me just so super weird. I, I don't turn it off. I know it makes me sound like a freak. I can't really explain it. Boobs are cool to me. And yeah, it, I understand that they're not to you. I have to admit, it was weird when you got yourself a pair of boobs. That did seem strange to me. But you know, I, it's that. Yeah, it's not my thing. I'm more into pesticides. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, if boobs were as cheap as pest dispensers, I would get several for around the house. I'd have some in the closet. I'd have some, like, beside the toilet. I would have some, yeah, just wherever our boobs might come in handy. Yeah, you chose a cheaper pest. <laughs> uh, bye. Anyways, um, I think we've run our course when we get that far off the rails. So we're going to go ahead and call it a night, bring it to a close, bring down the room a little bit here. And tell everybody that I'm Big Yankovic. And I'm Rich Outfield. And thanks for listening, everybody. Now here's a little number I like to call Tom Cruise Crazy. Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise Crazy. Just be glad it's him, him not you. I really don't know that song. <laughs> That Gets My Goat is produced under Creative Commons, Albert Houston, non-commercial, no deliveries, 3.0 license. But that will be our little secret. But you'd be the only man on earth who couldn't enjoy Tom Cruise. Oh no, you couldn't enjoy Tom Cruise. Muffet. What was it? Why did you say Muffet? We were in the theater, and uh, for some reason, you said Muffet. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, that's hilarious. What is that? And I was like, wait a minute. That's our parody. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember what it was either. There was a trailer for one of those types of films. Oh, is it just Hercules? Oh, yeah. I think it was Hercules. Um, We got to end this. Oh, okay. Is that okay? Sure. I'm, I've got to go to the bathroom so bad. I'm just going... <laughs> Oh, you know, just the sweat starts to pour down. <laughs> so if you want to stop right. it and we can continue later and just run over to Walmart right now, that would be great. But okay. 